the reason why is, is you and I were visiting just before this was went to the grocery store the other day, bought a pound of bacon. Um, prices are high. Um, I've heard it from many people out in the public spectrum trying to understand what's going on um, with hog prices right now. And so I wanted to kind of just throw that out there and, and see if you could start to give us some some ideas of what's currently happening in the industry. Yeah, so we'll work our way towards bacon, but right. I know we have a little bit of time here, so I'm going to start broader. Yes. And, you know, th this might sound like a nightmare to some of our listeners. The economist is talking at you. Uh, but supply and demand is what we use to describe, right, the prices and quantities we observe in any marketplace. And that certainly holds in the pork space. And the supply side tends to be better understood than the demand side. And almost all my comments here are going to be from a U.S. perspective. So that's the disclaimer up front. But we have things like USDA reports that are used around the world, not just in the US. And they largely quantify the number of animals or breeding intentions and things like that, which is inventory counting, right? That's supply side metrics, but don't really do it, do a service. And it's not their purpose, so it's okay to understand demand. And I usually interject here, Laura, that it's really important whether you run a, a seed stock operation, you know, fairing operation, finishing operation, or all the way to the meat side, even if you are at a restaurant level, all the way through this vertically connected chain, all the revenue available to you starts with end user consumer demand. So you and I are two of many on this planet that are those end user consumers that demand protein, in this example, pork. And it's really important to go further with that is understanding demand is important because that's where your opportunities start from. Those dollars trickle from there is why I say that. But secondly, there's three different market channels. So we have export or foreign demand for U.S. pork products. We have the domestic retail, right, your grocery store, which is where those bacon comments are most prevalent at the moment, or the domestic food service, think restaurants, and to be complete here, um, hospitality and so forth also falls in that bucket. But all of our protein goes through one of those three channels. And protein is fairly expensive when you talk about what hits our plates. So we try as a world to not waste much of it, right? So it usually goes through one of those channels and hits a consumer whether it's somebody like me in Kansas at a restaurant, somebody in Iowa in a grocery store, or maybe somebody in China, right, be an export consumer, is that's really important to understand those differences. We also don't send equal proportions of the gilt or the barrow through those market channels. Uh, we tend to export things that look and smell, taste a little bit different than what stays at home because the demand for them is different. The comparative advantage of the U.S. system is different than some of our global competitors around the world is part of that. But that's not just domestic versus foreign. Even staying at home, we don't send equal proportion through food service and restaurants. And a bit of a history lesson for our listeners, you know, we're now more than a year and a half into the pandemic. I hope towards the end of it. But again, I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not an epidemiologist. I have no clue on that front. But more than 18 months ago, we were in the heat of the economy shutting down. And one of the main impacts that had for protein demand was food service. So away from home, meat demand took a serious hit because foot traffic through restaurants took a hit. People quit getting on planes. We didn't stay at hotels. Uh, folks like me that used to travel a lot, I ate a lot of pork products at a hotel breakfast when I was traveling a lot, right? I mean, pork owns breakfast. It still does, but the nature of that has changed. And specific to bacon, it was something like two-thirds of the bacon that was consumed domestically was away from home pre-COVID. Well, when you shut down restaurants, I mean, literally for weeks on ends and we're slowly getting it back open. And then just general traffic travel took a hit. That hit bacon demand more than, say, loin. So loin historically wasn't as dependent on that. So I'm giving a lot to your listeners here, and I'm going to do that for the next probably half hour here, Laura. But I hope to reiterate the consumer demand piece isn't understood as much as supply. It's really important we monitor that. I'm going to share some resources in a moment to get geeky about how we monitor that. But before I lose people there... We don't send equal parts of the animal to different markets. We have these three different market channels, and it gets complex real fast, but that's a global market at work. And I truly believe, sincerely believe, Laura, that our more complicated market that allows a country like the U.S. that's really good, technically efficient at pork production, to get its products somewhere else that demands them the most is making the world better, right? We produce more protein at a lower price, and the right kind of protein gets to the right people because of that. And nobody should apologize for that. That's a great thing. Uh, it's not unique to U.S. pork, by the way. That's a global thing. There's a globalized system I'm describing there. But it's very complex. And the pandemic is putting some wrenches in that complex system for sure, too. 